So just a brief background about myself. Laura covered some of these things. I'm currently the executive director of the Technology Entrepreneur Center, which is in our Granger College of Engineering. Been doing that for about 11 years. Uh, uh, I'm also an entrepreneur in residence here at Enterprise Works. Uh, been doing that for probably about 14 years or so. And while I, I, Laura, Laura Appenzeller approached me about doing that while I was doing a startup here at Enterprise Works, which was called Pattern Insight, which I launched with my advisor from computer science when I was a student. That was a, a, a company that was funded by the SBIR program at NSF. And that's how I really got introduced to the NSF pipeline of, of, of programs to help launch ventures. That company was later acquired by uh, VMware. We went through the whole, uh, I'd say, life cycle of NSF funding and, and uh, success, and that was very or helpful to our program, especially as we went through the, the recession in 2018. It really kept us alive. Uh, one thing that that did is it introduced us some people, introduced us to some people that ended up launching those. Those people at NSF actually ended up launching the iCore program, and really got us introduced to the iCore program or Innovation Core. If you're familiar with that, and we'll talk a little bit about that program today. I'm the co-director of the uh, current i hub here in the Great Lakes region or Midwest. And so that's been a, a really influential program for commercialization across the, the region here. Uh, let's see, I mentioned those other things. And I think another key thing that's, that's kind of given me, you know, kind of give you a little context to where I come from is I frequently review for the NSF programs, uh, commercialization programs, the SBIR program, uh, i and the PFI program as well that we'll, we'll talk about today, the partners for Partnerships for Innovation. Just kind of curious, people in the room here, how many people are familiar with PFI program? None? Great, that, that, that maybe you'll give us a little value add for attending today. That's, a, that's a, a, a program that's kind of been revised the last few years, which is a great source of funding for uh, proof of concept funding for, uh, for teams at the university. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, just briefly, I included this here. It's, when we hand out the slides, you'll see this. Just kind of an overview of some of our, our uh, programs across our ecosystem. I, I, I realize this isn't the, the greatest way to, to look at our ecosystem because this is more of a, 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 a slide that shows kind of some of our main programs. It's not a way to, to, to traverse our ecosystem, but it's a great way to see a lot of the, the, the resources that we have available. It's a, we do have a vibrant ecosystem here on our campus and, and sometimes it's not, it's not easy to, to see where they're all located, but we've, we've spent a lot of time putting this together to show a lot of our resources that we have. There are a lot of, of uh, resources here to help you if you're on campus or, or close to campus to, to take your technology and commercialize it. All right, so uh, let's get started here. So th there's a lot of different frameworks about thinking about how commercialized technology. And there, if you look, there's, there's all kinds of ones. But when I, when I think about it, I think there's a lot of, there's, there's several different buckets or categories to think about. And I think the main ones that I always think about are your technology, your innovation, capital or funding that you need to take at the market, uh, your team, you need to build a team. Uh, obviously, you need skills, and then often you need a community to, to participate in to help take that to market. You can take any one of these and blow it out into several different subcategories. And there's again, there's a lot of frameworks, courses, workshops uh, to, to, to break these down into to different levels. We obviously don't have time to dig into all of these, uh, but I'm going to stay at a high level and talk about a few of these. Today, I'm going to focus a little bit about on some programs and ways to think about the technology and the innovation. Then we'll talk a little bit about funding and, and capital about some of these. Uh, I, I think capital is an interesting one. Often we get we get people to come to us, first thing they have an innovation, they have a something that they've got interesting and they'll say, can you introduce us to your venture capital friends? We're ready for venture capital. And it's, it's usually the worst thing you could do right away. There's things you've got to think about on the technology innovation side and then also around the capital side as well. So. But that is one of the questions we often get asked right up front. So before I get into in, on the innovation and technology side, I think some of the key things that we often get asked around are intellectual property, uh, you know, validating what you're working on, how to, how to really think about, uh, uh, you know, you're building the right things. And then after that, how do you build a proof of concept or how do you, how do you prove out that concept that you're working on? And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the programs that are resources on campus to help you do that. All right, so I'll talk a little bit about university intellectual property uh, process. I, I've noticed over the years that uh, I was just having a conversation with someone in the tech transfer office here. The, on, on our campus, it's called the Office of Technology Management. Uh, just recently, just in a, uh, this happens often, but just a couple of weeks ago, I was in a meeting with several people, and I, I asked the question, or I asked what questions would you like me to answer today? And uh, 
more than two or three people raise their hand and were just not familiar overall what the process is around intellectual property on campus. Okay? I think we're fortunate here at the University of Illinois as we have one of the friendliest tech transfer offices to work with. Uh, and and they're, they're much easier to work with than some of the other peer institutions that I've, I've uh, crossed paths with, that I, I work with regularly across the, uh, the Midwest here. And uh, so I, I think that's one of the first things to remember when you're, when you're here on our campus is we do have one of the, the easiest ones to work with and have some of the easier policies in, in place, okay? So uh, the Tech Transfer Office is actually responsible for managing the intellectual property and technology here on campus. So I'm just kind of curious, in the room here, and, and if, you're on, if you're on the chat, you can, you can respond to it as well, but how many here in this room would, would consider themselves familiar with the university's intellectual property policies? Okay, Laura doesn't count. <laughs> so, so, so a couple of you, okay? And I saw a couple of maybes, so. So let me just say a couple of uh, th some things about the intellectual, just in general. Let me just say that I'm stating this in general. So there's, there's, I'm going to paint with a very broad, broad brush stroke here. But in general, the university has something called the general rules, that, or the policies that govern the intellectual property here on, on campus. And the general rules basically say the university owns all intellectual property developed by university employees or anywhere on, anyone on campus. It could be students as well. Uh, you, that, that use intellectual or university facilities, equipments, or funds to develop that, okay? Now they grant exceptions to students if they're on campus and they're using resources or facilities uh, use, that are usually and customarily provided to students, okay? And that could be things like dorms or computers or facilities that are just usually and customarily provided to students. Now, the question is, what does that mean, okay? So in general, again, these are general statements. There could be specifics to apply to your situation. But in general is how I like to think about it, is if you're a faculty member or a graduate student, like you're working on research, if you develop something in the course of your work, and that's gonna be owned by the university. If you're an undergraduate student and just going about your business, maybe taking a class, you're not doing research, if you come up with an idea on your own, it's gonna be yours, the university doesn't own that. Okay, that's in gen those are general statements, okay? Now, if you're a faculty member or a graduate student and you develop something through your research, the university would own it. If you want to commercialize it, you would go sit down with the tech transfer office and you would end up starting a company and then you would license that technology back to your company. You would do that by sitting down with the tech transfer office and agreeing to specific terms with them and coming to an agreement with them about that, about terms. And you would. You would agree to certain terms around a small percentage of ownership, perhaps royalty agreements, but there's just a few specific terms you would come to an agreement with them on. And then you'd form that company and you're up and running. And that's basically what the process is. There's a few other details, but you would sit down and go over that with somebody from the tech transfer office. Okay, it's a pretty straightforward process that happens many times over the course of a year on our campus. But the key thing is you go through this with a tech transfer office, or in a tech transfer manager that's over your specific area. Okay? And if you have any questions about this, like if you're a student and you go, you know, I've got something, I'm not sure, like maybe there's something that I've got a question, I'm not sure if there's some ownership or issues there, you would sit down with the tech transfer office and, and ask them questions and they would go over that with you. Okay? Often there's these misconceptions on campus that the university sitting there trying to take your stuff, which just isn't true. Okay? Any questions about that? So now if you're in a room and somebody asks you what the university's policies are, you go like, I know what they are. I'll raise your hand. Uh, so some of the other common questions. Oh. I might add to that. Sometimes they don't want your stuff there. So <laughs> if you're a grad student and you're thinking, I know like the university is packing my technology and then I'll license it back and they'll do the expensive back part. That isn't always the case. So don't make an assumption that just because you disclose to the university that they're necessarily going to make a license agreement with you. Yes, so sometimes is what happens is you'll go to the university and you'll go down, you'll disclose something. Even if you're a graduate student and it comes out of your lab, you may talk with them, you disclose to them, and they may look at it and go, I'm not, we don't, we're not gonna patent this, and they'll grant you exclusive access, they'll grant you access to it, and it's your IP going forward. And you can actually start a company from it. There is one company right now that's very popular, that's going, doing well, they've raised several, you know, significant amount of money, and that actually, the IP is owned by that student in their company because the university just decided they didn't want to patent it. And that happens sometimes. It doesn't mean that it's not, that it's not uh, 
a promising technology that can be commercialized. It's just for whatever, sometimes the university makes those decisions, okay? So a couple of other t uh, c common questions there. So we explain what the policy is. Will the universe, I already talked about, will the university own my IP? Can I start a company? In, if, if, you're a, if, you, if, if you're a faculty member, a graduate student, you want to commercialize, the university uh, will often let you do that. There's very rarely would they ever go against the inventor or the creator. In fact, I don't think it's happened in, uh, I was talking to the head of the tech transfer office. He said he hasn't seen that happen in his time here ever. If you're, if you're a faculty and want to uh, commercialize that. Will the OTM help me, uh, help me with a patent? You'll sit down with them and go over those issues and they'll, uh, they'll help you evaluate whether it's worth going forward with a patent. One other thing I'll just say here before moving on, uh, the, the university has something called a lean startup license, where if you're a faculty member, you're perhaps trying to go after an SBIR grant, they have a lean uh, uh, startup license, used to be called an option license, will allow you to quickly get a license to go after an SBIR grant, and it'll delay the negotiations or the, the uh, 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 terms that you have to agree to till a later point in time where you can quickly go after an SBIR grant. Okay? So I just put it on here. Uh, main thing is if you've got any questions, you can reach out to the tech transfer office. Okay? Very easy to work with. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so with regards to the Lean Startup license, would you need to be far along in the process of having your team and think a little bit about what the next steps would be? Good, good question. So if, let's say you're going to apply for an SBIR. And you, because part of the SBIR process is like, what's your intellectual property status? And it helps you to have a, a license in place, OK? A Lean Startup license delays some of those conversations to a later point in time for a very specific time. And so you can put those, you can sign that lean, li that lean startup license and get moving along and being able to say you have a, a, an agreement in place, okay? But if you have any other specific questions, reach out to your tech transfer office, but it's delaying some of those conversations to a later point in time that gives you access to use the IP, okay? Good question. Okay. The OTM is, uh, is evaluating the technology ownership specifically. They're not evaluating your chances as a company or your team or your organization. That's all. We got lots of other resources yeah. to help you with that. They are very specifically around intellectual property management. Does yep. that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Michelle in the chat from OTM just mentioned um, it's a great way for companies to get started when they're looking to do translational research um, but aren't going to be selling anything yet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Again, if you've got any questions, uh, reach out to the Tech Transfer Office, reach out to me and I can help you get connected with them. Excellent, okay. So the next part that I wanna move on to is, uh, after intellectual property, is just another part about the innovation is you've got an idea and you wanna figure out what do, I, what do I do with it now? Because often we have, uh, especially faculty and graduate students, may have millions of dollars, or maybe not millions of dollars, some do, but some don't. Maybe you just have an idea and you wanna figure out how do I validate this that I'm working on the right thing? Uh, or you want to show some traction because perhaps you're going to go out and raise venture capital or you want to raise some angel money or you're going to go after an SBIR grant or some other funding and you want to show that you've got some traction with it. Okay? How do you do that? Because that's one of the most important things that you can do or show if you're trying to raise some capital. Okay? So uh, the one way to do that is we've got, uh, we've got some programs that can help you do that. And uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that as the i program, okay? And so I've got this chart that shows where these programs fit in place, and I'm gonna do that in, in terms of showing an NSF-centric pipeline, okay? Uh, and I understand that this is an NSF-centric pipeline because NSF has a nice pipeline of programming. And I'll show you where that fits in, and I'll talk about a few of these programs in a second. Now, uh, as you can see from this chart, that it starts with either NSF-funded research or a non-NSF-funded research, because these programs are available even if you don't have NSF-funded research, okay? So after you, if you have an idea, whether it's uh, uh, research-funded or not, there's an opportunity to participate in regional uh, i core programming, okay? We hold those programs here on our campus. We have programs that take place in this room here, or we have some other ones that take place virtually with participants from across the region. After that, there's a, a program called PFI Tech Transfer. There's also a PFI uh, 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 Research Partnership Program as well. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. This provides, this gives an opportunity to get up to $250,000 in proof of concept funding, okay? That takes place over the course of uh, uh, 12, to, or, uh, 12 to 18 months, okay? And this is to build proof of concept. After that, you have an opportunity to participate in a, the NSF I-Corps Teams program, 
that can provide up to two hundred uh, or up to fifty thousand dollars to validate your idea as well. After that, you're in, in line for an SBIR uh, grant, which provides an additional funding, up to two million dollars of funding to val to uh, commercialize your technology. Okay, so this is the pipeline that can help you validate your idea. In total, there's a lot of money there. Uh, if you add PFI to this as well, you can get up almost two and a half million dollars of funding. Okay, from the National Science Foundation. Okay. One yeah. question. In terms of the order, uh, just looking at the NSFI core team, looks like that you qualify for the PFI team. You caught something very. That's, there's a little nuance to this, and you picked up on it. Okay. So uh, PFI uh, has two requirements. Okay. That, that, that are it's NSF lineage, and you get NSF lineage from two possible ways. One is NSF research funding, but you can also get it from participating in, in, in the NSF teams program. Okay. Now. Let's say you have NSF research funding, but you haven't participated in the NSF Teams program, then during when you get a PFI award, they require you to take some of your budget and per, to take that to use to participate in the NSF Teams program. Does that make sense? I explained that clearly enough. So if you haven't participated in the Teams program, you have to do it with your PFI award and allocate, take $50,000 of that and use it to apply to participate in the Teams. But if you use if you participated in teams, you can use that as your NSF lineage. Okay. So this is the this is the the uh, the ideal way to flow into it because then it saves you. Uh, that, this is this is the ideal the way they'd like to see it, but it can also give you lineage if you're like say funded by the EDA or funded by uh, USDA. Okay. Good question. You caught that. Any other questions? So, so let's talk a little bit about what i -Corps is. Uh, just curious, how many people here are familiar with the i program? All right, good, a few of you are. Uh, so it's what i is, is i is Innovation Core was a program that was funded about, uh, about 10 years ago to help ensure that people are spending time building things that, are, that, that make sense and have customers lined up when they go through, okay? Because NSF found that most teams were building stuff no one cares about, okay? It's that simple. And so they started this program uh, Manfredo, you participated in ICOR, right? What did you learn when you participated in ICOR? I'm sorry to put you on the spot while you're eating. Yeah. Mm. Um, I had the most interesting, well, I learned whatever thing, but uh, um, I learned that um, when you confront uh, your technology, in, in my case, uh, they own uh, the same people that you trying to talk. They give you great ideas that, that you even never imagined. So it's a uh, really oh we can do that. So this was very eye opening. Of what um, we have a broader vision of what we we can do. Uh, we end up knowing that uh, they really need this technology. But uh, this was a very very unique experience that said that they give us this uh, new idea that we didn't even think about. E Excellent, thank you. I think that's a common thing that you hear from people that go through the i program is they come up with new ideas, finding out broader ways to apply their technology. And that's what people find out when they do it. We do have a quick question. Um, if you have a jump purchase grant for tech innovation, can you apply for a non-NSF funded research grant to further develop your product? Through through the I Corps program, I don't understand that question. Yeah, one has nothing to do with the other. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I, it, uh, so whoever asked that question, uh, I, I, I'm not. If you're if you're asking if you can apply, if you got jump arches, if you can apply for I Corps, uh, I, I think if that's what you're asking, the answer is absolutely. But I'm not sure if you're asking if you can apply for a non I Corps grant. I'm not. I, yeah, I, I'm not sure. That would depend on who you're applying to. But if you're asking if you can apply for i -Corps, one of the i -Corps programs, absolutely. Uh, if you're asking if you can apply for PFI, you, you would have to participate in an i -Corps program before you did that. But I think uh, Manfredo's point is exactly what i -Corps is about. It's helping you take your technology, helping you to apply for market, understanding where your technology has value to and, and to whom. Uh, so I think the other key thing, the value for participating in the i -Corps is your entryway to $2 million of, of uh, NSF funding. Your chances of, of getting uh, that funding from, from NSF dramatically increases after participating in i -Corps. Okay. 
Yes, Laura. Do you have to have NSF lineage to participate in I-Corps? Good question. The answer is no. You do not have to have NSF lineage. Let me let me say one thing about participating in I-Corps, though. You to get into the NAC, the Teams program, you do have to participate in a local program first. Okay, unless you have NSF, uh, unless you have a research grant. So if you participate in uh, one of our local programs here or the, the hubs program, then yes, uh, or then, then you can go to the national program, the teams program. Uh, so uh, let me just briefly just mention about these programs, the, the Illinois i and the hubs program that we run. Uh, we're, we run both of them. The local program is more of an introductory program. It just kind of gives you, if you're just curious about what customer discovery is, you may, do, may not have as much time, that's the right program for you. The regional program or the, the jumpstart program is what we call it. That's a more serious program. It takes, uh, we, we expect you to put in about five hours a week as you go through that program. You're with peers from the Midwest and Great Lakes region. And then both of those programs, uh, if you complete them, uh, uh, align you to and qualify you for the teams program that is the, the, the national program that will give you $50,000 to do customer discovery. Okay, so next steps if you're interested in those, reach out to one of us on our i -Corps team and we'll help give you more information, help you apply for those programs, and then attend one of our i -Corps hub programs. Okay, proof of concept funding. So, uh, as I mentioned that, if you've, if you've validated your idea and you need to build a proof of concept, which you do, uh, an excellent opportunity for that is the NSF uh, Partnerships for Innovation Program, okay? This is a program that's been around for quite a few years, but it's went through a major renovation over the last couple of years as Jesus Soriano has taken over that program. Uh, he has a collaborator on that, or a, a colleague on that program as well, but Jesus has really made some uh, uh, phenomenal modifications to this program and really aligned it with the i program and the SBIR program, okay? So this program provides, there's two, there's two forms of the PFI program. There's the TT program, which stands for Tech Transfer, and then there's the RP, which stands for Research Partnerships Program, okay? The TT program is more, I think of it as like an individual person program. Uh, this provides $250,000 over 12 to 18 months, and this is, uh, it's, it's basically proof of concept funding, okay? We should be submitting lots of these on our campus. Uh, they'll, they'll award two of them per campus per year, up to two of them. And uh, uh, th they've got lots of money to be given away. I, I I've been on the panel for these every, uh, the last bunch of years every year. And uh, it's an excellent source of funding. And the, the, the couple of things to think about these is instead of an SBIR grant that goes to, the, to a company, these go to individual, these go to research labs as a faculty member, okay? So you don't have to stop your job on campus. You don't have to find an external PI. These go to a research, to a faculty member as a faculty member on campus. Think of, think of this as SBIR within a university, okay? And it's an excellent source of funding. The RP version is significant amount of more money, but uh, it's, it's, you have to have an industry partner for that. Okay, it's five uh, five hundred fifty thousand dollars over three years. Okay, and you have to have a you have to have an industry partner. Each one of these, uh, the TT one specifically, uh, it, the RP one has all this, the same requirements as the TT, but you have to have an industry partner. You have to have a commercial team member. A com uh, uh, I can't remember the wording I had for it. Uh, you have to have a commercial team member on this. So often it'll be somebody from the tech transfer office. I've been a team member of several of these but it's somebody on your team focused on commercialization, okay? But is what it does, bottom line, is it provides you an opportunity or funding to get, uh, uh, to build a prototype, okay? Here's the eligibility for it, NSF lineage, it can come from research grant from the National Science Foundation or participation in NSF or I-4 teams program, commercialization expert, okay? RP has the same requirements and you have to have an industry partner. Now, key thing, key takeaway from this, the deadline for the next one is in a uh, little less than a month. So I would encourage you, if you're interested, go take a look at the solicitation. There's also some webinars that Jesus has done that you can go look at on YouTube. Watch the webinar, and if you're interested, reach out. I'm happy to, to talk with you about it as well. I just served on a panel uh, this last go around. Uh, I, I do it every year, and happy to give you some feedback. I would encourage you to do it. They fund a lot of proposals. They've got a lot of funding, okay? And I am convinced if you put a solid proposal, you've got a great chance to get started. We do, you know, we're good at getting proposals in it at, at Illinois. 
In next steps for this, watch the recorded PFI info sessions and check the incoming deadlines on their webpage. Okay, for, again, great source of funding for teams. All right, any questions about PFI program? Let's talk a little bit about funding. So, uh, you know, you can find all kinds of lists about certain types of funding, but let me just briefly talk about a few and then we'll talk about uh, uh, a specific type. So, if you're, if you're looking for funding from your teams, this is just a list I pulled from, a, from one of the websites. I was looking at, uh, to find a, all kinds of sort of lists of funding, but this is a, I felt was a good one. There's many different types of funding. There's bootstrapping, which if you're familiar with that term, it's, it's basically getting funding from, from without using uh, uh, funding like venture capital and, and outside funding. There's friends and family investors, which people often use to get started, crowdfunding. Incubators and accelerators is often a source of funding that many of our teams use. That's where you participate in structured programming. Uh, and incubators like Enterprise Works and accelerators like programs like Y Combinator. We've got many, many teams from here go to Y Combinator or Techstars Chicago. They typically provide some funding uh, for a small piece of equity in your company. Uh, angel investors and, and venture capital, they provide funding in exchange for some ownership of your venture. Uh, and then small business, oh, then let me just mention uh, at the bottom there are some, some very appealing type of funding, which is when you get, fu you, you get funding directly from a customer or a partner, okay? That's often a, 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 an appealing type of company for small, small or, uh, 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 startups. Uh, but one that I want to talk about today, and because I won't go into venture capital and, and angel investments right now, because we have other workshops here at, at Enterprise Works that where we address those specifically. The one I talk, I'd like to talk a little bit more about today is the, uh, uh, the the small business grant, specifically the ones offered by the federal government. Okay, and that's SBIR and STTR. Uh, these ones are, are a phenomenal set of source of funding that we we get often here at, in. It, uh, for our teams here at Illinois. Now, one thing I do want to qualify by with when, when I say that is that I think these are excellent sources of funding, but I think it's that the, my philosophy with these are that they shouldn't be your only source of funding. Uh, th you should only use these as you're as your use seeking out other sources of funding. I think if you only go for SBIRs or it's your sole source of funding, I think that's a recipe for going out of business. Uh, you shouldn't just chase SBIRs and STTRs. I think you need to be looking for uh, preparing yourself to raise some other capital or get customers or you're gonna get in trouble. Uh, so let, let me just say a couple of other things. The, the, there are 12 federal agencies that are involved with the SBIR program. They're all, and they all have slightly different rules, but they're, they're all kind of similar, but they do have slightly different rules. I do a lot of work with the NSF. I've been involved with NSF programs for, for about 15 years. So I'm most familiar with NSF. I, I mentioned earlier, I, re I review for them every year. And so I'm gonna talk more, you'll see my slides have, are heavily, uh, almost exclusively have NSF content. But I think NSF is a good program to work with. I'm totally biased, but I feel like they're the easiest to work with. They're the only agency that has full-time SB, SBIR program managers. And I think their content works well with the other agencies. So I think if you, fo if you, if you, you, know, if you focus on NSF, you, it translates well to others. But just, just be aware that there are differences between the other agencies. So uh, whatever I say, you know, goes for NSF, but you gotta check with the other ones. But they're, but they're, pretty, they're pretty similar, okay? So that's what I qualified my statement there. But these are great federal grants. Uh, with NSF, you get up to $2 million, over $2 million of funding without giving up ownership in your company, okay? So let me start with that. So here's a model that shows the NSF's program. And again, they're all pretty similar to this. Let me just say that the, you, the thing that you see in the second phase there in the, in the graphic is a little out of date, so I put the real numbers for 2022 here on the side. Phase one, you can get up to $256,000 for a phase one. This is a feasibility study. If you do well on that, you can apply for a phase two, which is a million dollars, okay? And then after that, you can apply for a phase two B, which is up to $500,000. Now, in the middle there, there are some supplements you can get. You total all this up, and if you apply for I-4 and the other ones, you can get up to you know very close to two million dollars. Okay, so excellent source of funding there. Uh, and, and once you get in, it's pretty easy to get the rest of it. Okay, uh, one question I often get is, what's the acceptance rate? The I don't know what it is right like immediately now, but the last time I've heard the data from the program managers, its acceptance rate is typically ten to or around thirteen to fifteen percent. But that's, I feel like those numbers are skewed because uh, 
they, a lot of the submissions they get are not good submissions that are, meet the requirements. So once you take all those into place, it's much higher than that. And once you participate in i and you do a good job in i it's about five times that number for teams that go through the national i program, for the teams program. So uh, if you do all that, you're much, much higher, higher likelihood of getting it. Yes? Uh, what does the PFI support uh, postdoc to carry out the research? Good, good question. So all of these are the same. They, are, they, they support uh, research. Okay, they don't, fund, they don't support customer discovery, they don't start, support marketing. This is the same for PFI or SBIR. They support research. Now, let me just qualify that by saying you can get a lot done un, under research. So it depends on how you, how you write your statements, but they, they, will, they, they all fund research. So you have to have some, when you put your proposal together, and we cover these in some other workshops here about what's, what, what can go under research, but the, the main thing is just thinking about it, it's it develop it, it's about developing your product and doing research under their technical work. It, you can't you can't have in your budget like I'm the CEO and I'm going to do go do marketing. I'm going to go meet with customers. They don't fund that type of work. It's research. Okay. So going back to that earlier question about uh, PFI and uh, like how early can I be? This is a great chart right here from the NSF that shows where their different programs fit in. So as you can see on the side here. There's, they've got some, some programs like the Goalie program at ERCs, which is basic research, and then you see where P, they see PFI fitting in, and then i and then STTR and SBIR. So typically is what happens is, is in the lifestyle of the, or the, the, the innovation uh, uh, pipeline or innovation uh, life cycle of, of technology, there's a lot of funding available for basic research, and then it starts to fade off. And then before, before private investment and private capital can flow in, there's this valley of death that they call. And the, the SBIR program or funding is, was invented to help teams or companies make it through the valley of death before private capital can come in. So as you think about that, NSF, uh, their goal is to fund risky companies that, that, that the uh, private capital is not ready to fund yet. So uh, I'll talk about that in just a, just a minute. Uh -huh. Um, we've heard a lot about how impactful the i program is for future funding. Will you be discussing the stipulations of the i program, i.e. applying to it, time commitment, etc.? Uh, I can. So let me get that in. We got time. We got time. We got 20 minutes. Uh, so uh, the question about will I get funded by the NSF? Uh, the, the, question is, uh, the question I often get is like, will the NSF fund my technology? Like in my two early stage, do I just have, I'm a single person or I just have one or two people working? Uh, here's the latest set of data. This is a few years old, but last time I, I've seen it a few times, and this is from directly from a, uh, one of the program directors. As you can see, like last time they collected the data, again, this is a year or two old since I, since I got it, but as you can see, most of their teams are early stage teams. Uh, look at that, 91% of the awarded companies did not have previously funded phase two awards which means they're, they're really trying to get away from, from SBIR meals or people who are just going after SBIR funds over and over again. 85% uh, of the awarded companies were less than five years old, and 75% were first-time SBIR award winners. It's from NSF, uh, NSF's data. So think about that. Like they're, really, they're really trying to award uh, uh, younger teams. So, and then five times more likely to get an SBIR award to go through i -Corp. Okay, so just quickly, uh, what they fund, they fund R&D, high-risk innovations. So don't worry if you're too risky. Uh, that's what they fund. And they're looking for high impact, and they're trying to de-risk. Like I showed you on that, that, that innovation life cycle, they're trying to fund risky teams before other, right, before other teams or private capital will even invest in it. They don't fund basic research. Uh, increment, they don't fund incremental or uh, improvement. So if, Sometimes somebody will say, like, I've already got this product and I just want to add this enhancement to it. They don't fund those type of things. Okay? Let me just uh, get to these last things. PFI, SBIR, what's the difference between the two? Right? We've got these two different programs that kind of sound similar. Uh, a couple of key things that I'll say, as uh, so I already mentioned, PFI goes to a researcher at the university. Okay? SBIR goes to a company. Okay? Big difference. I think of PFI as SBIR within a university. Often teams here have trouble finding out who's going to be the PI on an SBIR grant. You can't be a faculty member, keep your full-time job at the university, and be a PI on an SBIR. You can for, an, for a PFI. Okay. 
Uh, PFI has a commercialization expert named on the team. That's a requirement for a PFI. PFI requires NSF lineage. It can come through either the research grant or participating in NSF I Corps teams. SBIR doesn't. Okay, you can just apply for SBIR. Uh, I think those are the main difference there. Oh, PFI, two other things that are really interesting with the PFI grant. PFI has a strong educational component. Okay? So you have to explain how you're going to educate people, how you're going to educate graduate students in entrepreneurship, in commercialization, and there's a strong DEI component as well. And let me just tell you, it's just they're not just paying lip service to the education and DEI component. They actually want to see how you're going to educate people and, 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 and really incorporate DEI into it. It can't just be you have some you have some students, some undergrads or some some K through 12 students, and you're just going to walk them through your lab. That's what they keep saying. It's just, it doesn't cut it. They really want to see how you're going to make a difference. Okay. Next steps: SBIR website and the Fast Center website. So, what is the Fast Center? Fast Center, SBR funded, uh, the uh, SBA funded Illinois Fast Center is housed here at Enterprise Works. So you have access through the Fast Center here to help you with your SBIR grants. Okay, so if you're sitting there and you're going, how do I do an SBIR? How do I put it together? Uh, we've got excellent resources here at Enterprise Works to help you with your SBIR. Do monthly SBIR 101 workshops and sprints to help you put that together. Okay. And uh, we get, we're phenomenal at getting SBIRs here at Enterprise Works and in the region. And you can get a link to sign up for the SBIR workshops and that from Enterprise Works website. Let me just, and Laura, anything else that I miss on that for the FAST Center? Uh, we have a workshop next week, I think maybe two of them next week. So we have, we uh, consistently have FAST Center workshops and we want to repeat that too in case people can't hear it, but um, I will put it in the chat, the information Great. and resources there that are available. So Laura put in the chat more uh, how you can sign up for SBIR uh, Fast Center. Uh, other resources here at Enterprise Works, you can see here, there's, enter there's entrepreneurs and residents that can help you. So I'm just mentioning some of the resources we have here on campus to help you. Uh, uh, we've got all kinds of resources here at Enterprise Works that can assist you. I mentioned some of them here. Uh, everything from uh, weekly uh, uh, lunch and learns and startup cafe. There's AWARE funding to support women and diverse entrepreneurs, uh, student shared services, SBIR technical assistance, designer and residence. You can see all this on the Enterprise Works website. Uh, one other one that I'm going to mention specifically is the iStart early stage funding. This is a, a set of programs and funding that assists you. It's an 80% match of funding to provide legal services, business planning, SBIR assistance, payrolls, uh, financial and payroll services, and optional additional services. You can see it here. Uh, it's for teams that are in their first year launching. Uh, you can get more uh, uh, details from this from the uh, website, from the Enterprise Works website. So take a look at this. The key thing is no equity is taken in your company if you apply for that or, or uh, get it. It's competitive, so take a look at it. But 84 companies have been awarded uh, some of those awards over the years. So take a look at it. Uh, it's available to you uh, if you're one of the teams here locally. In the slides that we'll provide, I've got other campus resources there from Enterprise Works, Illinois Ventures, the Office of Technology Management, and then our i program. Okay, question and answer. All right, going back to the original the question that I didn't address yet, uh, i -Cor. So uh, you, can, you can find out the i web the details if you go to i And uh, if you apply and you've got technology and you're willing to put the time into it, we're, we'll get you into one of our cohorts. And what was the other question with it? Uh, the time, time commitment. commitment. Yeah. Time commitment. Okay, great. So it depends on one of the programs you apply to. So uh, I mentioned we have a short course that we do here on our campus. If you're just curious about what customer discovery is, uh, that's what we call a short course. You'll do, we expect you to do about five customer discovery interviews as you participate in that program. It's a five week program that goes, it's, it, the course goes over five weeks. You do three or four workshops over the course of that five weeks. Again, you're expected to do five customer discovery interviews over the course of that uh, five weeks, okay? Now, let's say you have a technology, it's a little bit more advanced and you're committed to participating. Then we have our Jumpstart program that we do with our partners over course uh, across the region. 
As you participate in that program, you're going to do 20 to 30 customer discovery interviews, and you're going to be qualified to participate in the i Teams program, which is the national i program, okay? You should be, ex you're, you'd be expected to put in more time than that over the course of those seven weeks of that program. There's five workshops over seven weeks. Then the national i program, the Teams program, uh, that is a more rigorous program. That goes over seven weeks, and that is, uh, depending on what role you play of your team, it's a three-person team and you'll get $50,000 in the National Science Foundation. And uh, that is, again, that's a rigorous program and you're looking at 10 to 20 hours per week. It's a phenomenal program. Uh, uh, I recommend everybody goes through it that can. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's like run like a startup. Manfredo went to it. I can see Manfredo smile on his face. He absolutely loved it. Yeah, so when you say what I learned, uh, so you discover, yeah, your technology that you discover, but one of them, most profound thing you discover yourself, your company, your father. Yeah. That is because they just go very deep with question who you are, yeah. what you want. So you self discovery. They self discovery. That's right. Manfredo discovered himself in the National I Corps program, well, in, and they give him fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. And I win. Exactly. And he wins. And that's that to to film this commercial here. It is. I mean, look, what Manfredo said is true, and it's and it's. This is what you often see when teams go through the national program because they work you hard. It's a lot of work, and it's. Uh, but you get done, and it's. Is what they try to do is they really try to compress. Uh, Several months of work in this very short period of time, and it, it, they they get you they get you going hard, and, and it's a they try to make it a startup experience. Boot camp. Boot camp. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Question. Do you have any advice for putting together that team? Good question. So I'll tell you what our what our challenge is. The, okay. Good. The, the question is. Any advice for putting together a team? So let me go over the requirements for the national program and then I'll address that part. So to participate in the i Corps Teams program, you have to be, your technology has to be connected to the university. Okay, so you have to have some connection to the university, which can be technology out of a research lab or your technology can be affiliated with like a course. Okay, something come out of a course, okay? So once you have that, uh, you, if, you've, if you're funded by the NSF, you can apply directly, but 95 or 90, between 95 and 99 percent of the teams have participated in one of the local programs, being one of our, our local or regional programs, okay? Then is what you do is you have to put your team together. Is what, nine, what most all of our teams struggle with, you have to have a three-person team, okay? There's an entrepreneurial lead, which the prototypical entrepreneurial lead is a graduate student that's affiliated with the lab or the technology. Then you have the principal investigator or technical lead, and then it's the industry mentor. Our challenge often is the industry mentor because we're in central Illinois and we're not in like Silicon Valley where you walk out and there's 300 entrepreneurial mentors that are looking to participate. We often struggle with finding the mentors. That's, that's our, our bottleneck. And so is what we do uh, for entrepreneurs, so, so the first two are usually fairly easy because they're involved with the team from day one. For the industry mentors, we're usually struggling to find, or our challenge is finding people that have time to participate and uh, 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 have, the, have the background in the technology. But we just leverage our networks. We, we always encourage the team to reach out to your network and find somebody that's committed to you, that, that's a friend, that, that can, can actually spend some time to go do it. And then if, if that doesn't work, we'll press you hard to try again. And then after that, then we'll start looking in our networks and find somebody in our ecosystem that can, that can, can do it. But I'll just be honest with you, that's the bottom end. Find somebody available. But I would say, uh, to me, it's like, we, you know, there's, a, there's a strong value proposition for participating. As you heard Manfredo, there's a value proposition for participating in it, and uh, uh, even for an industry mentor. And th that's that's how I do it. It's like you talk to them about the value proposition, and it's fun. Like it's a good time. So ultimate question: Nobody ever understands the difference between the I Corps programs. Can you go over that again? I just did it, Laura. <laughs> it's not my question. No, I'm just kidding. It sounds like I've got a problem. <laughs> okay. The so difference between the question, specific question is: What's the difference between the Illinois I Corps and national program? Okay. So. Uh, let, let me just say there's there's let me try and see if let me practice doing this and see if I can do a, a better job of it. And I was just joking. It's 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 I understand why it doesn't come across as clear. So there's a short course, there's a there's the Illinois short course, there's the technology jump start program, and then there's the I Corps Teams program. 
the short course is, as you would imagine, it's an introductory course that, that is, uh, we don't go into as much detail, and it's for someone that just says, yeah, I mean, it's, it's mainly, we often, the, the course that we're doing this summer, the, the, jump, the short course, is just student teams, right? It's mainly undergrads, and it's, it's, it's I would think of it as a very introductory course uh, where we don't go into as much detail, and it's expected that teams will, will do five customer discovery interviews, okay? So introductory, think short course is introductory, it's very light, we don't go into as much detail. Then the next, the next step after that is what we call the technology jumpstart program, okay? And we, we expect teams to do 20 to 30 customer discovery interviews, okay? And, and there's small stipends that are available to teams that participate in that, okay? But you do some customer discovery interviews, 20 to 30, uh, 30 interviews. We focus, if you look at the business model campus, we focus on the right-hand side where we do value proposition customer uh, segments. Those are the main things. And we, do, we, we help you develop a business model thesis or a, a business thesis statement for your company or for your, your project as well. Okay, so think about that. So those are the two programs that are put on by us the Illinois, uh, the Illinois I Corps program and the the Great Lakes Region Hub. Okay, so is that clear? Is that is that is that clear for those two programs? Then the the third program is the National Science Foundation I Corps Teams program. Okay, that is what after you after you participate in one of those two programs uh, and you get 30 customer discovery interviews, you qualify for the I Corps Teams program, the NSF I Corps Teams program, which we all, also refer to as the national program. With that, you get a grant from the National Science Foundation for $50,000. You go to that program. That's a rigorous, more rigorous program where if you participate in that program, you do 100. This is why, why, why Manfredo was saying it's like boot camp. You do 100 customer discovery interviews and go over that over and do that over the course of seven weeks. It's 13 customer discovery interviews a week. Rigorous. You there's you spending uh, 15 to 20 hours a week participating in that. It's it's a it's a lot of work, and it's a lot of fun because if, if, you're meeting with you're, you're meeting with like-minded people. You're in a cohort of of 25 teams like yours across the country. It's fun. I was I was actually team number eleven. There, now they've had close to three thousand teams participate. I went with Phi Optics. If for some of you know Phi Optics, they're here in Research Park. Uh, we were team number eleven, and and you're with teams like yourself, and you'll see those teams uh, be successful, and some of them are still in business. Yes. Can you explain again the connection between PFI and ICOR? Yes. Okay. Does that does that before I do that does that answer the question? Is it clear? Was I clear? Did I do a better job? Yeah. And then we have another PFI question. Okay, all right. PFI and i -Corp. PFI and i -Corp, right? All right, okay. So PFI has a requirement for NSF lineage to participate in PFI. You have to, you have, to have lineage. You can't just off the street apply for PFI. Lineage can come from one of two ways. You can have an NSF-funded research grant in the last seven years on that technology, or you can have applied, you can have participated in the NSF Teams program, the program we just talked about, the rigorous program. Sorry. Okay? Now, let's say you had not participated in the NSF Teams program, but you have, uh, perhaps you, were, uh, you, you just have an NSF grant and you apply and you've got a PFI award. That means then is what you have to do is you have to allocate $50,000 in your, your PFI budget and you are required to participate in NSF Teams. In the, in the I4 Teams program, okay? That makes sense? So think about it like this. Either way, if you get a PFI award, you are going to have participated in the I4 Teams program by the time you're done with your PFI award. Whether you have participated in before you got the award or after, you are going to have participated in the PFI, in the I4 Teams program if you get a PFI award, okay? All right, other question. Um, the PFI solicitation mentions a need for at least one letter of support from potential commercialization partners. Um, can you elaborate on that? I think that is for the RP PFI award, not the TT PFI award. And, but honestly, I would probably submit one anyways, even if you're doing a, a TT. But I'm not, I, I believe that for the TT award, you do not require, it does not, the latest solicitation does not require an industry partner, if I, if I remember correctly. But double check that. Good question. Anything else? Yes. What is the difference between SDR and STTR? 
Good, great question. Okay, so the question was, what's the difference between SBIR and STTR? Uh, so the, they're, two, they're the same program. Okay, well, they're different, they're different programs, but they're run the same way. Uh, let me just tell you, from a reviewer's perspective, there is no difference. Like when you sit on a review panel, you get a stack of papers, and when you're, you read them, and then when you are sitting actually in the review and you're actually reviewing them at NSF or online, uh, you don't even pay attention except when the program manager says, oh, hey, by the way, this one's an STTR, okay? So functionally, there's no, like, as a reviewer, you don't even know the difference unless you're paying attention and notice it says STTR. Now, the difference is, is in the budget. So an STTR, uh, it's, they're still submitted by, you just have to have a PI that's outside of the university. It's just with an STTR, a, a certain percentage of the budget has to be allocated to a, 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 a research, or a, like a non-for-profit research center. Okay, so typically is what happens for an STTR is someone would do an STTR if they want to fund some of their research in their research lab. Okay, now the way I see it is like, you're gonna lose a good chunk of that money to the university. <laughs> like that's how I see them. Is like, uh, if, you wanna, if you wanna capture most of that $256,000, do an SBIR. If you, if you need to fund your labs, or if you wanna fund a lab on campus, then that's why you would do an STTR. That's the difference. But functionally, like they're, like they're reviewed the same way. There's also a lot more money in the SBIR program. That's the other thing that's different. There's a much smaller budget in NSF for STTR. But again, they're reviewed exactly the same. If that's helpful. Other questions? We uh, we're, we are at <coughs> one o'clock. I probably have time for one more question, or we'll end there. All right, looks like we'll end there. All right, thanks everybody. Reach out if you have any questions. I think my I have my contact information there. Jed T at Illinois.edu. Reach out if you have questions. These are great programs. Uh, thanks for joining us today, and uh, happy to help.